Well, we continue our sermon series on the Alpha Course, which are the basics of the Christian faith, hitting very basic topics about Christianity. And today's topic is, why did Jesus have to die? Wow, that's kind of a tough question, I know. And there are many puzzling things for me, like why are Panama hats made in Ecuador? Or why the Russians always celebrate the famous October Revolution in November? Or why the flight data black box in commercial airplanes is actually orange? Or why is it that facial recognition software can pick a person out of a crowd, but the vending machine can't recognize a dollar bill with a bent corner? Or like when COVID-19 shut down the gyms, 87% of the customers didn't even know they were closed. Maybe they weren't using their membership. When it comes to the Christian faith, one of the most difficult questions is, why did Jesus have to die? One of my favorite restaurants in Hawaii closed down. You may remember it. It was called Cafe Sistina. Great Italian food. The ceilings and the walls were painted like Michelangelo's work, the Sistine Chapel. It was gorgeous. And there was a waiter there named Davio. And he made me a cross like the one I'm wearing now. I don't normally wear crosses when I preach, but take a look at this. The cross, a symbol of the Christian faith. Mine is not the traditional vertical and horizontal, but the cross is kind of a logo of Christianity. It's a clue as to why Jesus died. I was not raised in a Christian home. My dad born here was uh, raised in a Buddhist background. My mom was raised in a Christian home in uh, New York City, Chinatown. While I was a teenager here in Honolulu, my sister in college in California shared with me about Jesus. And there was a verse in the Bible I learned that said that the Son of God, that is Jesus, loved me and gave himself for me, for us. He died for us. He gave his life for us. And I, I thought that was like puzzling. Why does Jesus have to die for us. I was told that Jesus loved me so much that he would give his life for me and, and did. But why did he have to give his life for me? I learned that God is a loving God. He really loves us and he wants to bless us and he gave us a beautiful earth with clean air and clean water and he would do anything for us. In the long game, he wants the best for us. He wants us to be a lifelong, eternal friend. Friendship, and it's a word that Jesus used when he was on the earth to, to refer to, to humans. He calls us friend. But there's one catch. God in heaven is holy. So holy that no sin or imperfection can be near him. Remember Moses when he met God in a burning bush? He had to take off his sandals and go slowly towards the bush. He was that holy. Well, that's not a problem, I thought. I'm a pretty good guy um, with sandals on or not, slippers on or not. Not perfect, but pretty good guy. But pretty good is not enough to live a fruitful life on earth, nor good enough to get me to heaven to be in God's presence. But I thought God said, when humankind was made, we were not only good, but we were very good. We are a very good creation. And we are a people who can do noble things, honorable things. And yes, God created us to do extraordinary things. We can paint beautiful paintings like on a ceiling in um, Sistine Chapel, like Michelangelo, or, or write beautiful compositions like music by Mozart, or novels by J.K. Rowling, or scripts and films like Marvel movies. 
we humans can do courageous and heroic self-sacrificing acts. But the fact that we admire and honor and reward self-sacrificing acts means there's something admirable when a person puts his or her life on the line for others who are weaker or are in a precarious spot. But that is what Jesus did. He gave his life for us humans who are weaker and in a precarious spot. But we can say, what do you mean? How are we weaker? You talking to me? You talking to me? You're saying I'm weaker? You're saying that I'm in a precarious spot? Even though people can do impressive things, there is another side of the coin. We are not only capable of doing good stuff, but we're really capable of doing bad stuff. I mean really bad stuff. And for some, evil stuff. Any day, look at the newspapers or headlines on your news app and you will see how people do treat one another not in a consistently loving way. We might be tempted to say, well, there are good people in the world and there are evil people, so the good people should be a shoe in to be with God forever. But then the Apostle Paul in the Bible said that we have all sinned, all of us. And when the first person, Adam, sinned, the virus started and we all carry sin and have the capacity to sin more. And if we have sin in our lives, that's a hindrance to getting to a holy God. Now, the word sin is not a word we like. It's, it's also um, has been diluted, right? Like you hear a commercial that says that the product is so good that it's sinful, like Krispy Kreme donuts. Sin means we have missed the mark. We miss the target in living a pure, loving life. Anytime there is selfishness or self-centeredness in our life, inappropriate anger or hate or revenge, that's a symptom of sin in our lives. And sin blocks us from God and hurts our relationship with other people. We know there is sin in our society because we can't seem to follow the Ten Commandments. Just ten laws. And humanity has to create other laws and break those too, so we have to create more laws which we will eventually break. In fact, I wonder, has there ever been a law created that people have not broken? Isn't it hard for us to say, I'm sorry, I ask for your forgiveness, whether with a friend or a relative or a colleague or a boss or a spouse? It's really hard to admit we are at fault. And yet we know we aren't perfect, but we're always trying to project as if we are. It's amazing when I read what some people put on their accident claim uh, on their forms when they're trying to explain to their insurance company why they had the accident. Like one man wrote, going home, I drove into the house and collided with a tree that wasn't there. Or another man wrote, the other car collided with mine without giving me a warning of his intention. Another person wrote, this guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. And finally this, a person wrote, I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. There's something about us that doesn't want to admit that we are at fault and that there's sin in our life or any sin in our society or if there is we tend to think it's not that bad but even if there's a little bit of sin it does spoil our whole life there is no area in our life that cannot be tainted by sin but is a, is a little bit of sin bad i'm just a little selfish so why is that bad? Because it infects our whole life. But you say, what's a little sin? Good question. But think about it. If I were baking you a cake and you saw me sneezing into the batter, 
Would you eat the cake? Ew. Or if I put in a, not to get too gross, a teaspoon of saliva, or you found hair in the batter, or a fly or two, would you later eat it? No. Of course not, right? But even if it's just a tiny bit, the germs would spread. It would be contaminated, or we would just be psychologically turned off by just the thought of it. So, even if we would say, I am mostly good and just a disgusting teeny bit bad, if there is a tiny sinful bent in our lives, we need to take care of it um, because we can't be in the presence of God who needs us to be cleaned up of that because it spreads. And if we're honest, we would admit that we're not always thinking of others, we're not always generous, and we often are self-centered, selfish, and we want our way over others. I think of the song title, Why Do We Hurt the Ones We Love? So then, what is the solution? What is incredible about Jesus is that he claimed he is God. And if he is God, then he's perfect, absolutely perfect. But get this. The Bible says that Jesus chose to bear our sins as he was unfairly crucified on a cross and he died for our sins. And by doing so, he removed forever the curse of sin so that we can be in the presence of a holy God and be with him forever and bask in the Holy Father God's love. God may have created us with the capacity for sin, but then incredibly, he would take care of that by sending Jesus. And if we turn to him, we would live abundant, flourishing, fruitful lives. And it's amazing, the Lord lived with us, Jesus, for like 33 years or so. So, but why would an innocent person be willing to die for others? Have we ever seen that? Is it that far-fetched? Well, in July 1941, a prisoner escaped from Auschwitz, you know, the horrible Nazi prison war camp. And as payback, the Gestapo there selected 10 prisoners arbitrarily to die in a starvation bunker. And one of the men selected was Francis uh, Gajavnicek. And when he was selected, he cried out, no, my poor wife and my children, they'll never see me again. Don't choose me. And at that moment, a little guy, a Polish man, in glasses, wire frames, stepped out of line. And he took off his cap and he said, look, I'm a Catholic priest. I don't have a wife. I don't have children. I would like to die instead of that man. To everyone's amazement, the Nazis accepted his offer and he was taken to the bunker to starve until he died. Awful. But he didn't die quickly. And while in that bunker, he supported the other prisoners there. He got them singing hymns and praying. But on August 14, the Giscopo said, we need the bunker for other people who are coming. So they gave him a lethal injection of carbolic acid and he died. 41 years later, the death of the priest was put in proper perspective in a ceremony to honor him. 150,000 people showed up in St. Peter's Square in Rome, including the man who was saved, Francis Gajovnicek. And the Pope was there, and he declared in front of everybody the de death of Maximilian Kolbe that Polish 47-year-old priest who stepped forward to give his life, that was, quote, a victory like the one by our Lord Jesus Christ because he gave himself and he gave up his life out of love. Francis Gajovnicek died at the age of 93 and he spent his life going around telling people about this love of this man who died in his place. 
And that is why followers of Jesus like to tell others that Jesus, who was God, died in their place, your place, my place. God loved us so much that he gave himself for us. And now the curse of sin is gone and I can go to heaven. You can go to heaven. And we know sometimes people, you know, tell me, well, I don't want to go to heaven. But you know, if God is pure love and he died for us and he's in heaven, then choosing not to go to heaven where love is and instead to choose to go to a place where God is not, where there is zero love and zero peace, that's not a wise choice. It's called hell. We can think we're just human beings, just human beings. No, we are all eternal spiritual beings who for now are in physical bodies, but only for a while. And as spiritual beings, we have a choice available to us right now on where we will live for eternity after we leave here on earth. And the hard thing is when we say, okay, so Jesus died for me, but I don't need to live my life on earth as if he did. I, if I just believe it and know it, I don't need to change my life in honor or in memory of him. That's it's sufficient. Well, I remember my friend Tony Campolo telling me a story of how the parents of a soldier who died for his fellow soldier during a war wanted to meet the soldier who was saved by their son. So they invited him over to dinner. And when that rescued soldier arrived, his clothes were a mess, he was disheveled, and he was drunk. And during dinner, he was rude, he was inconsiderate and mean, saying inappropriate things, and at times swearing and cussing. And when he finally left, at the end of the evening, the mother, fell into the arms of her husband, crying and wondering, how could their son give his life for a man like that? And we can hear that story, and we can get mad and say, yeah, what a jerk that dinner guest was. How could he be so ungrateful? Why couldn't he live a life of gratitude because someone died for him and he was saved, given a second chance to do good? Why didn't he show appreciation to the parents? Well, the catch in the story is that maybe we are that ungrateful guest. If Jesus did die for us, are we showing appreciation? Are we living a life of gratitude to Jesus and God the Father? That we have been saved from a life of sin that hurts us in this life and in the next and are we living a life in honor of the one who saved us? The hard thing about sin is this, and I call it the four Ps. Got this from Nikki Gumbel. The four Ps. First, pollution of sin. Jesus says sin will pollute your soul and our relationships. Second, the power of sin. The bad stuff, the bad habits will become addictive and you will become a slave to it. It's the stuff we do that makes us feel terrible, but we feel the only way we feel better is to do it again and again. Third P is the penalty of sin. The penalty. When something goes wrong in our society, we think someone should pay for it. Someone should be brought to justice. Someone who has killed an innocent person needs to pay for that. There needs to be justice. And when someone has killed innocent children or person because of their color, we say someone has to pay. If someone steals, we say someone has to pay. It's the reason that Jesus died. There has to be justice in, there, in this world when there is sin. But the crazy thing is that God said he would come down to earth to pay for the penalty of sin for everyone. 
And this is shocking. If this is true, it is mind-blowing. And when we see people do wrong things, Jesus says, don't judge them. In fact, the Bible says, you therefore have no excuse when you pass judgment on someone else for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. And then the fourth P is this, the partition of sin. Partition meaning it divides, it parts. Is it not true that when we have offended someone or someone has offended us, it is hard to look them right in the eye? We might try to avoid them because there's something between us. And similarly, when we do wrong, it has caused a partition between us and God. But you see, this brings the amazing, incredible, phenomenal good news for the follower of Jesus. God, as Jesus, chose to die for us to cover our sin, yes, our sin, to cover the payment for all that we have done wrong. And yes, Jesus died on a cross because he was paying for our sin. But the thing is, it's not to concentrate on his pain, though crucifixion was incredibly painful, being nailed to a cross for six hours. Yes, he suffered physically, but we have to understand, the point is by taking on all of our sin, he took on a spiritual suffering for all of that sin. Every single sin anyone had done or will do fell on him at that point. And God did that because he loves us. Well, maybe this parable explains God's amazing just love. There were two friends, friends at school, at the university. And when they left, they went their separate ways. One became a successful lawyer and actually a judge. And the other went into a life of crime. And one day he got caught and ironically, this criminal appeared before his old friend, the judge. And the judge had a dilemma. I mean, what would he do? I mean, he loves his friend who had pleaded guilty to the crime because he had done it, but he couldn't just give him a get out of jail pass simply because he was a friend and he was the judge. I mean, he had to be just. That's God's dilemma. God is a God of justice. And if there was no justice in the world, the world would be a terrible place. But also, God loves you. So this is what the judge did. He fined his friend the appropriate penalty, which was about $50,000. And that was justice. But then he took off his robes and went around to see his friend. And he wrote a check for $50,000 and gave it to his friend. That was love. And this is what Jesus has done for us. What he did was more than $50,000. He was crucified on a cross for all of our wrongdoing and sin. And his love was far greater that needed a far greater solution. And when that happened, the power of sin was broken. The Bible says, the Son can set you free. And if Jesus sets you free, then you will truly be free. Or as the Apostle Paul wrote, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And when we have been forgiven, we can forgive others. But then, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to forgive others. And it's often harder to forgive ourselves. As British scholar C.S. Lewis says, if God has forgiven us and we refuse to forgive others, it's like setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than God. God forgives you, accept it, and forgive yourself. Again, C.S. Lewis said, Everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something 
to forgive, and then it's really hard. Some say the first to apologize is the, is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. The takeaway is, can you really accept the forgiveness of God and understand now why Jesus died for us? But another practical takeaway is, can you forgive? Now, I had the good fortune of meeting an amazing woman named Corey Ten Boom. And many years ago, I got to spend an hour alone with her asking questions about life and faith. And um, Corey Ten Boom, if you don't know, was a Dutch Christian who during World War II hid Jews from the Nazis. And, but she was caught, she and her family, and they were all arrested, her father, her sister, and herself. And they were taken to separate uh, concentration camps. Uh, her father um, died in one camp and her sister uh, Betsy died in the Ravensbrück concentration camp where Corey was also. Uh, but Corey miraculously survived. And after the war, she toured the world talking about forgiveness and her faith in God. But at one time in 1947, after finishing her talk in a church in Munich, Germany, a man came up to her, and when she looked at him, her heart stopped. She recognized him. He was one of the camp guards in Ravensbrück. Now, he didn't recognize her, but she recognized him, and suddenly the memories of his cruelty came flooding back in her mind. But then she was shocked to hear him say, thank you for your message, a wonderful message about forgiveness. I have now become a Christian, and I know that God has forgiven me, and I want to know that you forgive me. And he stuck out his hand and said, shake my hand as a sign that you've forgiven me. And Corey said those memories of his cruelty and of her dying sister came to her, and she said she just stood there and could not forgive him. Her sister, Betsy, had died in the concentration, concentration camps, and he was one of the guards. Did he think he could erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? She said it could not have been many seconds, but he just stood there in front of her with his hand held out. And she stood there and said, quote, with the coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an emotion. And she said, forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. And then she prayed and said, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. Help me. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so she stiffly held her hand into the hand of her former guard. But then she said an incredible thing took place. She said a current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being and bring tears to my eyes. And she said, I forgive you, brother with all my heart. And for a long moment, they just grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. She said, I've never known God's love so intensely as I did then. You see, God loves you immensely, and he forgives you, and he empowers you to forgive. And for me, when I understood this, it then totally changed my mind. And to think, for me, it resulted in dedicating my life to telling others like you about Jesus and forgiving all. Now, you don't need to become a pastor after that realization, but we all, we all can make the decision to accept the gift, the gift 
that comes to us via faith. Remember that cross I, I, I talked to you about at the beginning, the one I'm wearing? I said it's not a traditional cross. The horizontal part is slightly um, lifted up, right? Almost as if hands up in joy and praise and thanksgiving. And that's how I see the cross. Um, Davio, the jewelry, jewelry maker, said he called this cross that he gave me redemption. And I am so grateful that Jesus died for me. I'm so thankful. I, I don't want to take it for granted. And I see the cross as my redemption. There's no dead body on the cross. Jesus is alive and we are redeemed. And with hands up, like the cross, I praise and thank God. What God has done is a gift offered to you. And you don't have to wait to respond. Your spiritual journey could start today with God. And may we all remember the Son of God loved and gave himself for you and for me. Please join me in prayer. Lord, I know what I shared today might be brand new for some people. And I know for others, they knew about it, but I pray it might go deeper in our hearts and our souls, that you died for us and you gave your life for us and you want to be eternal friends with us and you paid the penalty for our sin that we can live eternally in, in heaven with God the Father, who is pure love. Lord, there may be people here today who might be saying, okay, this is it. I want to follow this Jesus. I'm getting it now. And I want you to for, forgive my sins. And I want to go all out for you. And if there are people out there who are at this point for the very first time in their lives, or maybe there are some who want to recommit their lives to you, may they say this prayer with me in the silence of their hearts, and may they really, really mean it. Just a simple prayer, Lord, that they might say with me, saying together, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. Please forgive me. And I thank you that you did die for me and you took care of that sin, that curse. And I don't want to be like that ungrateful soldier I want to live a life that is thankful to you. And so please send your Holy Spirit into my heart, my soul. Empower me. Live in me. And yes, Lord, give me the power to forgive others who have hurt me. Give me the power to forgive myself. I'm ready to start this journey with you in a new and meaningful way. And so I praise you and thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, the good news is that Jesus is our hope. He's our living hope. And now just before I give the final blessing, and blessings are really important to kind of send you on your way with, with God's blessing upon you, um, I want to say right now, if you want to join one of our Alpha Connect groups um, that we meet to discuss the sermon, uh, the themes uh, with some others, and we have a facilitator there, you'll notice um, there is a button you can hit when we're done that will put you in a, a discussion group. And so um, please take advantage of that, and you know there are other groups later in the week too. So um, let me close with this blessing for us all. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and his countenance be upon you. And may you know deep in your heart the wonderful love, the wonderful sacrificial love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And may you be empowered to accept his forgiveness and forgive others. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Aloha, ahui ho, and I'll see you again next week when I continue with another sermon in this series.